Okay, so we'll go ahead and start. Um, good evening and thank you for joining us for another virtual program brought to you by the Mattapoisett Museum. Uh, my name is Jessica DeSico Carey. I'm on the board of directors at the museum. And tonight our program is offered to you free of charge. Thank you to the Mattapoisett Cultural Council. Um, if you'd like to make a donation to help offset future programs, um, Maggie is going to drop our donation link in the chat. And after our event, you'll also receive a survey so we can gather your feedback um, for this event and future events. So Zoom etiquette rules apply tonight. Uh, please mute yourself for the entirety of the event. If you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Maggie will read them during the Q&A portion of the event. So tonight we welcome Dr. Daphne Palmer Genicopoulos. Uh, Dr. Daphne Palmer Genicopoulos is a historian, journalist, and author of The Pirate Next Door, the untold story of 18th century pirates' wives, families, and communities. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Southern Living, Virginia Business, and other outlets. She lives in South Yarmouth, Massachusetts with her husband, David. So welcome. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you to the Mattapoisett Museum and the Mattapoisett Cultural Council for hosting this virtual event. And thank you to all of you who turned out tonight. I am very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you tonight about a book I've been working on for many years. It is the first ever direct account of the life of Sarah Kidd, the wife of the notorious pirate, Captain William Kidd. Sarah lived a long and storied life, and I'm going to give you a glimpse into it. I'm going to show you some slides, and I'm going to do a reading from my book. I hope you all will find Sarah Kidd to be easily as interesting and remarkable as her famous husband. Generations of readers the world over have known the story of Captain William Kidd the noble sea captain and privateer who turned ruthless pirate. The history of the golden age of piracy in which Kidd played an outsized part is replete with the exploits of pirates of many stripes who hoisted the black flag and prowled the seas attacking 17th and 18th century merchant vessels bound for the West Indies West Africa and North America. Kidd's story is particularly striking. In 1699, Captain Kidd became the subject of a deadly political scandal involving top officials on both sides of the Atlantic, including the King of England. There was a worldwide chase and eventual conviction and execution at the hands of colonial authorities who may have been complicit in Kidd's darkest acts of piracy. It was a drama laced with lies, secrets, double dealing, betrayal, and buried treasure. The story of his journey from privateer to murderous pirate has been immortalized across the centuries in print, on stage and screen, in video games, and even in an epic 22 verse ballad. But our understanding of his legend is incomplete. What is largely unknown is that Kidd had a partner and accomplice, a behind the scene players, a behind the scene player who enabled his plundering and helped him outpace his enemies. This accomplice was his wife, the English born Sarah Kidd a young, well-to-do New York socialite whose extraordinary life is a lesson in reinvention and resourcefulness. Sarah was running a thriving merchant business in the New York City seaport when she met Captain Kidd. The encounter set off a high octane romance that often operated outside the law. While Captain Kidd was plundering the high seas, Sarah Kidd was pirating in her own way, within the confines of polite society, working to ensure her husband never got caught and that the location of his buried treasure stayed secret. 
With bold determination to survive and to protect her husband, Sarah secretly aided and abetted her husband. She fought alongside him against his accusers. The most impressive part is that even after Captain Kidd was put to death for his crimes, Sarah remained an incredibly beloved fixture of the community. She secured a long and prosperous life for herself and her children. Sarah knew how to persuade and she knew how to hustle. And in a time when women held little legal power, she found a way to ensure her future and to protect her family. But for more than 300 years, the story of Sarah Kidd has been all but erased from history. My journey into the world of pirates began in 2002 when I was commissioned by the New York Times to write a freelance piece for their museum's special section about the Witta Pirate Museum in Provincetown, Cape Cod. The museum contains artifacts recovered from the Witta pirate ship that crashed during a fierce nor'easter off the coast of Wellfleet, Cape Cod in 1717. Prior to writing this article, I didn't know much about pirates except what I had read in books and seen in movies. I thought all pirates had a pet parrot like Long John Silver in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island or look like the handsome and fit Errol Flynn in the 1935 movie Captain Blood or more recently walked, talked and wore eyeshadow like Jack Sparrow in the movies, Pirates of the Caribbean. Looking at everyday artifacts recovered from the pirate ship, silver coins, cutlery, pewter plates, a teapot with the shoulder blade of a pirate, pistols, cannon, navigational instruments, medical supplies, and even a size five shoe, leg bone, and silk stocking. I realized that these mythological figures were mere ordinary men. The legend of the captain Samuel Bellamy and his love interest Maria Hallett told me that pirates had connections on land. They had families and community links that we don't know much about. As I was researching my dissertation turned previous book, The Pirate Next Door, the untold story of 18th century pirates' wives, families, and communities, I kept encountering, encountering evidence of this mysterious woman who seemed oddly on the periphery of the story of the notorious Captain Kidd. Even the influential and authoritative early source book on pirates called A General History of the Robberies and Murderers of the Most Notorious Pirates by Captain Charles Johnson did not include Sarah in the lengthy chapter on Captain Kidd. Sarah was alive at the time that book was published in London in 1724, and it would have been possible for the author to interview her or people who knew her. Finding Sarah's initials, SK, scratched on a colonial document at an archive in Boston, started me on a thrilling journey to learn more about her. I would soon learn her initials mark the spot where love and law divide. To research Sarah's story, I had to use a variety of sources because women left little record of their affairs. Most women, including Sarah, could not write. Men owned all the property and exercised most of the legal rights at the time. I read the contextual history of pirates, end of the time period, to learn the political, economic, and cultural events that shaped Sarah's life. I was able to find some important primary sources of Sarah's, such as her petition to regain her seized property and her last will and testament. Many of the ancient sources that I relied on were handwritten and I transcribed over 250 of them to make them easier to work with. I visited archives in the places Sarah and Captain Kidd had been, including those in New York, Boston and Rhode Island. I traced Sarah's steps in the surroundings she visited 
and visited temporarily, especially in Manhattan, where she spent most of her life. I also found great resources in the Admiralty Papers at the National Archives in London. I found a rich cache of letters that were in a sea chest in Captain Samuel Burgess's pirate ship when it was captured by a British privateer in 1699. The letters were in the pirate's mailbag and contained a few letters from Captain Kidd's crewmen aboard the Adventure Galley to their wives and from their wives to Kidd's crewmen. The letters are dated from 1695 to 1699 and they show that correspondence was conducted thousands of miles across the globe between Indian Ocean pirates and North American colonists and that there was successful and direct communications between New York and Madagascar and back again. No letters from Sarah or Captain Kidd were among these letters and none have survived, but there is every likelihood that they communicated during his three year voyage through the Mariner's mail service that was located on Ascension Island, a remote outpost in the Atlantic. New York merchant captains trading with the pirates in Madagascar stopped for fresh supplies of turtle meat and dropped off and collected the mail that was left under a rock with a hole in it near the harbor. This letter from the wife of Kid's crewman, Jacob Horn, was especially helpful and informative for me. Writing from their home in Flushing, New York on June 5th, 1698, Sarah Horn told her husband, quote, we hear abundance of flying news concerning you. This meant that word had spread from port to port and ship to ship, and that there was trouble aboard the adventure galley. That trouble, we would later learn, was murder, mutiny, and piracy. To further understand the maritime world in which Captain Kidd was a part of, I attended a workshop at the National Archives and conducted research with scholars from the Prize Papers Project, which was a collaborative effort with the National Archives and the University of Oldenburg in Germany to research and categorize the thousands of yet unopened documents captured by the British in wartime in the 17th and 18th century. I examined trial documents, depositions, personal correspondence, ship's logs, cargo inventories, and even a mariner's personal journey that was worn from wear in his front pocket. The manuscript room at the Library of Congress was a terrific resource and Captain Kidd's own recorded statements gave strong evidence of his devotion to Sarah. Archivists and other historians I met were enthusiastic and helpful during my research, as was my trusty research assistant Higgins a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel named for a runaway pirate, Jeremiah Higgins. Here he is inspecting the galleys of the pirate's wife. Unfortunately, there are no contemporary paintings of Sarah Kidd. She can't be seen that way. But in 1911, the artist Jean-Leon Jerome Fair created this painting of Captain Kidd in New York Harbor. The attractive, beautifully dressed woman with a lace fan holding Captain Kidd's hand on the deck of his ship is an interesting rendition of a woman who has captured Kidd's attention. One contemporary of Sarah's described her as lovely and accomplished. And the woman in this painting is certainly lovely. Kidd's velvet knee-length coat, a sword at his side and a tri-cornered hat are historically accurate depictions of the attire of the period and what he would have worn as a successful sea captain. His gesture towards his lovely visitor, a suave gentlemanly bow and a warm clasp of her hand fits with the charming demeanor he was known to display. While this pa painting is a figment of the artist's imagination, 
And in 1911, we did not know the story of Captain Kidd and Sarah. There is coincidentally some historical semblance of truth in it. Born Sarah Bradley around 1670, the future pirate's wife arrived in New York from England with her widowed father and two brothers when she was 14 years old. At 15, she was married to one of the richest men in the colony, a much older wealthy merchant named William Cox. When Cox died tragically four years later in 1689, Sarah was 19 years old and she did what any woman of the time would have done. She married again, this time a Dutch merchant and mariner named John Ort. It was then that she met Captain William Kidd, a well-respected gentleman with whom she began a friendship. Captain Kidd was Sarah's third husband. Sarah was a twice widowed 21 year old, considered one of the most eligible and sought after women in New York when she and Kidd married just two days after her second husband's death. While the circumstances might appear suspect for Sarah and Kidd to marry so soon after her second husband's untimely demise, Kidd and Sarah were stellar members of New York society. They were New York's power couple. So no untoward behavior was ever proved. At the time of their marriage, the well-built, well-dressed 37-year-old sea captain who spoke with a hint of a Scottish accent was one of the most respected men in Manhattan. He was a celebrated war hero and sought after privateer. A privateer was hired by the government to legally plunder and seize enemy ships. He was a legal pirate. During wartime, the resources of warring countries were stretched to the limit and privateers were extra hired hands who owned their own armed vessel and served as an auxiliary to England's Navy. A privateer's assignment was detailed in a document called a letter of mark and reprisal. He had investors and the captured prizes and cargo was shared with his investors. The captain and crew got a smaller proportion of the take. There was sometimes a fine line between a legal privateer and an outlaw pirate. Many a privateer once out at sea and beyond the reach of the authorities turned pirate to avoid having to share the loot. There were some other reasons too. Turning pirate was an attractive alternative for some men, especially those with wives and families, because pirates lived a highly civilized democratic society. They were paid well when the going was good and they were treated fairly. Pirates lived by a set of rules called articles and each pirate had to sign his name, or if he could not write, leave his mark as an X to join the crew of a pirate ship. With that commitment to be true to his fellow brethren of the coast, as they were called, came benefits. Each pirate had an equal vote and most were given an equal share of the booty. There was a form of health insurance, life insurance and retirement benefits. The pirate community was designed to support and maintain their relationships on land while they were at sea. For example, if a pirate died in action, his share of the treasure was smuggled halfway around the world and given to his family. Turning pirate was a risky and dangerous choice, but for some men, a merry life in a short one was their motto. Sarah and Kid's wedding took place in Manhattan on a rainy Saturday, May 16, 1691. It was a day of high drama and grisly 17th century justice. England was at war with France. Pirates were plundering the high seas and two traitors, the self-appointed governor Jacob Lester and his son-in-law Jacob Milbourne were hanged for treason against King William and Queen Mary in the public square. 
Sarah and Kid attended the hanging after their wedding. A public hanging was an event everyone turned out for. It was a carnival-like source of entertainment. The stark contrast of the day, a love match and an execution, foreshadowed the dark drama that would be their life together. The kids lived in a mansion Sarah inherited from her first husband, located on the corner of Pearl and Hanover Street in the Hanover Square neighborhood of Manhattan. The waterfront property faced a wall, now called Wall Street in the financial district of Manhattan. Coincidentally, their home was just a few blocks from my publisher, Hanover Square Press, an imprint of Harper Collins. And I like to think that Sarah found my publisher for me. Around 1692, Sarah gave birth to a daughter, Elizabeth. And in 1694, she had another daughter, little Sarah. During the colonial period, giving birth was a social and bonding event where women looked after each other. Sarah's babies would have been born at home in a separate area from the main living area. Men were not involved in the birthing process, so Captain Kidd would have been busy somewhere else. It was the job of women, relatives, neighbors, friends, and elders in the colony to act as midwives to assist in the delivery. Special birthing linens were prepared and laid out. Sarah would have used a birthing stool, or perhaps a loved one held her upright and supported her as she progressed through labor. In the early stages, Sarah would have acted as a hostess of the festive occasion. It was an old English tradition for new mothers to serve groaning cakes, which was a sweet, nutritious baked good made of spices, molasses, rum, apples, and carrots, and to go with it, groaning beer. As they waited for the blessed moment, the women would entertain themselves with gossip, jokes, and stories. In 1696, Captain Kidd was given a dream job, two privateering commissions from the King William III. His investors were some of the most important men in England, including the newly appointed governor of New York and Massachusetts, Richard Coote, known as Lord Belmont. Belmont's complicated relationship with Captain Kidd would lead to his tragic downfall. In his brand new ship, one that looked like this, the Adventure Galley was a 287 ton warship with three tall masts, square rig sails, and 34 big guns. It was a hybrid ship called a galley, meaning that it could be rowed as well as sailed. His job was to hunt French enemy ships and to rid the seas of pirates who disrupted international trade. His commissions were for one year. His initially unsuccessful voyage led to frustration, mutiny, and eventually Kidd's turn to piracy. Sarah was key to Kidd's fight for his life against the men who accused him of turning from privateer to pirate. She and their daughters spent time on Kidd with Kid on his pirate ship, and Sarah helped Kid hide his stolen treasure. As an accomplice to an outlaw, she was arrested and, and imprisoned with him in Boston. Once released, Sarah helped construct the narrative Captain Kid presented in his defense. She ensured that he was taken care of in jail. She worked tirelessly to help secure a pardon and she even tried to help plot an escape. After Kidd was executed in 1701, Sarah lived another 40 years. She reinvented herself, and she managed to go from one half of a criminal outlaw couple back to a high society socialite. She secured her family's inheritance, remarried, had more children, and lived the rest of her life as a prominent and respectable citizen. She even learned how to write her full name. Sarah Kidd's extraordinary life 
is a rare example of the kind of life that pirates' wives lived during the golden age of piracy. Hers is a tale about love, marriage, motherhood, and survival. Sarah's life, and particularly her transformation from a New York socialite to a stateless outlaw, sheds new light on the political, economic, and cultural events of the late 17th and 18th centuries. From her, we learn about the economic hardships of widowhood, the political ramifications of piracy, the effects of war on the new and the emerging colonies, the business of slavery. Her life tells a broader story about how certain women were able to assert their will and reclaim their agency within the oppressive strictures of colonial America. During her 74 years, Sarah lived through seven British monk monarchs, 21 New York governors, and she experienced firsthand the golden age of piracy. She survived four husbands and three of her five adult children. The Pirate's Wife, the remarkable true story of Sarah Kidd, recasts the image of Captain Kidd from a diabolical pirate to a flawed but decent man who tried to please his investors and protect his wife and family. Captain Kidd was a pirate, but he was not one with a black heart. Sarah's initials SK, scratched on a few colonial documents, gave clues to her existence. Those bold pen strokes reveal a history we have only imagined, the dangerous, difficult, and thrilling life of a pirate's wife. They shed unexpected light on a young colonial woman caught up in a world of politics, passion, and grisly 18th century justice. The unknown SK is finally identified. She is Sarah Kidd, the First Lady of Pirates. I'd like to close by reading a passage from my book, The Pirate's Wife. I will read from the prologue. Sarah Kidd lay in a weakened state in the bedroom of her Manhattan mansion. A highly contagious lethal disease raged through the colony, striking young and old, rich or poor, black or white. It was September 12th, 1744, and the 74-year-old Sarah had first taken to her bed to get warm under her soft quilts and to rest her head on the goose down pillows. Then the chills, fever, and fatigue set in. She was nearly certain she had contracted the deadly disease everyone called diphtheria. As a precaution, she asked her family and friends to stay at a safe distance. She arranged for soft foods and a soothing drink made from the medicinal herbs in her garden to be left outside her bedroom door. Her mind wandered in a fever-induced haze. She closed her eyes and remembered herself in another time and place. She was a young woman with her husband, Captain William Kidd, on his pirate ship, the St. Antonio, a vessel laden with gold, silver, and jewels. As his closest confidant, she learned that he'd buried some of his stolen treasure for safekeeping, and he described to her where it was hidden. She was not to tell a soul. For more than 40 years since his death in 1701, Sarah, the pirate's wife, kept his secret safe. Not even her five children knew. She alluded to it in her will, noting that she had assets in the city of New York and elsewhere. She did not identify elsewhere. Sarah worried about the consequences if her children were caught with stolen pirate loot. Her strong instincts told her it was best to leave well enough alone. 
As she thought back over her life, not all of her memories were fond ones, especially the time when she was a pirate's wife. But now the memory of the hardships and the heartbreak had softened, and Sarah wouldn't have traded it for anything. She felt proud, very, very proud, to have been a pirate's wife, and she wore the title as a badge of honor. Sarah repeated a prayer as her condition worsened. Almighty God, have mercy on my soul and pardon and forgive me all my sins and offenses so that I may, after this miserable life, arise with our Savior, Jesus Christ. She became delirious from the fever and shook uncontrollably. The sheets were soaked with her perspiration. Still, the thought of that secret weighed on her, as well-kept secrets often do. As she prayed for forgiveness, she may have thought it was time to identify elsewhere. She wanted her three children to know, and they were pacing downstairs in the sitting room. It wasn't long before Sarah developed a sore throat that felt like a razor when she swallowed. She tried to speak, but it hurt so much she could only whisper. Her daughter, Elizabeth Kidd Troop, peeked through the keyhole to check on Sarah. The once vigorous woman now appeared very small among the many furnishings and tasseled curtains. She looked pale in her white cotton bedclothes and so frail on her side facing the door. Elizabeth saw her mother's lips moving, mouthing words, but she could not hear her. She strained through the keyhole to hear what she might be whispering. Elizabeth called for her brothers, William and Henry, who had stepped outside on the front stoop that faced the harbor. The cry of the seagulls seemed to signal the alarm. Elizabeth told them to hurry. Each took a turn at the keyhole, looking and listening. Sarah's breathing was loud and strained as she gasped for air. The three of them looked at each other with tears in their eyes when the room fell quiet. There was not a sound, not even a whisper. For over 300 years, treasure hunters have scoured the North American Eastern seaboard trying to find where elsewhere is. That secret is with Sarah, buried in the churchyard of Trinity Church Wall Street in Manhattan. Thank you. <laughs> that, um, the ending gave me goosebumps. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? Anybody? <laughs> Barbara, I have a question. Oh, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Do we know if she has any descendants alive or is that too much to ask? <laughs> I, I did research that and I could not find any. Uh huh. Okay. Barbara, you have to have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> I would, but. Um... I don't. It was a great presentation, though. It Thank was. you very much. Yeah. yeah. So when did you actually, maybe I do. Um, so was the Widow Museum that inspired your interest in Sarah? That was your starting point of interest? Um, my starting point with Sarah came when I wrote um, my first book. Oh, the first book. Yes, yes. And That's it right. was in writing that first book that I found Sarah. Okay. The Witta Museum inspired me to learn more about pirates and their relatives. In general, yeah. Yeah. So um, how long did it take for you to do all the research to write this book? So it took me three years to do the research and two years to write it. So this is a five-year book. Wow. That's amazing. 
<laughs> well, I think it's definitely um, going to be added to our museum gift shop. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think it'll be a great addition to the other books that we offer in the gift shop. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I when I visit Mattapoisett, I'll stop by your museum and sign those books for you. Yes, that would be wonderful. <laughs> I did. Do, uh, oh, can I hop in here? Yeah, go ahead, Maggie. Do my do my, do my second task of the night. <laughs> um, you have some questions in the chat. Um, so, um, is there any way that I could bring those up? Is that okay? Yeah. Of course. Of course. Yes. All right, so we have one question that says, what was the illness that rage, raged through the colonies? Diphtheria. There we go. That's that's what I was thinking. I was like, I think that's, I think it's diphtheria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one, um, what specifically did she do to protect her husband? She, um... When she was in jail, she uh, petitioned to get um, uh, fresh clothes and warm blankets for him because he was in solitary confinement, chained to the wall with 16 uh, pound weights. She, um, she petitioned to go visit him, to um, provide affection was the word she used in her peti petition. Um, and she um, helped plot an escape for him, and she bribed a naval officer into uh, giving a message to him once he had been put on the ship waiting in the harbor in Boston to go to England. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I like the affection, the affection um, in quotations, you know. <laughs> um, Mary Lou is very excited that the museum will have the book for sale. I agree, Mary Lou. Um, and we have, we have a few questions coming in. Everyone seems to be typing away their keyboards here. Oh, wow. um, is there anything known about her father and why they came to America? Yes. Yes, Sarah's mother had um, passed away. Um, there's no record of how long Sarah had been without her mother, but Sarah was 14 years old when she came to the New World with her father and two brothers. And her father was a mariner and he came to start a new life because um, the Newport, the New York Harbor was full of uh, trading vessels, and it was an opportunity for him to have uh, a lot of good work and a lot of good exchanges with mariners. So they came to build a new life. Nice. Great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and did you come across any pirate involvement with whalers or whaling? That's a good question. No, no, that is a good question. But whaling really took took place later in the um, in the eighteenth later in the eighteenth century, and this piracy um, period that I focused on, the golden age of piracy, took place. Um, in the late 17th and the early 18th century. And um, whalers were, were later and pirates weren't really involved in whaling too much at, at all, at all. Interesting, interesting. Um, did Sarah ever go to sea with him? She, she rendezvoused with him. They had a secret, secret rendezvous on Block Island, which he arranged. Um, when he came back from his three-year voyage, he sent his lawyer to contact her and um, uh, arranged a secret rendezvous with Sarah and the and their daughters. And she met. He came to Block Island in his pirate ship, and she got on the pirate ship with her two little daughters. Um, so she sailed with him along around Long Island Sound. 
she did not sail with him in the Indian Ocean when he was on his privateering voyage, which turned to piracy. But she was on his ship in Long Island Sound. And eventually they sailed around Long Island Sound, spent some time at Gardner's Island, which is an island in Long Island Sound. And um, she was also still on their ship when they cruised past the uh, past uh, Cape Cod up to Boston. So they entered Boston as a family on his pirate ship. Now that's a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Long Island Sound, listen, they weren't, you know, walking around mm -hmm. with Boston whalers just going out for a tuna. That's pretty, <laughs> cool. that's pretty awesome, actually. Um, let's see. Um, so where, uh, what was this say? Oh, I need my, my glasses. Um, would her marriages have been arranged and included a dowry? That's a great question. Her first, her first marriage was arranged um, with William Cox. He was 15 years old. And um, her second marriage was not arranged. She was by that time 19 years old. And... Her third marriage to Captain Kidd was definitely not arranged. So it was only her first one. Um, as far as dowry, uh, that's a really great question. She did have a dowry offering um, in for her fourth, for her fourth marriage. Her father helped her um, obtain some land and it made her more attractive. Uh, as a, a potential wife. If you remember, she was a social outcast and destitute after Captain Kidd um, was tried for his crimes. And um, two years after Captain Kidd was executed, she remarried. But she, she was, as lovely as she was, she was a pirate's wife and she was destitute. And so she was able, her father helped her um, obtain fam uh, family land and put it in her in her name. Oh, well, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, another one. We are just really popping out questions over here, guys. Now this is what I'm talking about. Um, where in England did the family come from? Was there any record of the family there? We don't know where the family came from. There was no record of where they came from. I do believe that they live near a port because her father, Captain Samuel Bradley, was a mariner and he owned transatlantic vessels. So they would have lived near, near the water. They also were quite wealthy. Um, she owned, she, she arrived in, in New York with a very large collection of personal silver that was hers. I don't have any personal silver. So she is, <laughs> she, she was doing pretty good, you know. Um, good answer, good answer. Uh, so what changed Captain Kidd from a privateer to a pirate? Captain Kidd, his, uh, his commission was for one year. And after one year, he did not find enemy ships. Uh, he was commissioned to capture French enemy ships and take their cargo <clears throat> and give it to his investors. He did not have anything to show for his year at sea. So he extended his voyage a second year and he still didn't, he did capture one ship, but he didn't have enough to really um, make it worth his while. So he extended it to three years. By three years, his men were mutinous and the ship that he uh, sailed on, the Adventure Galley was leaking. So mor the morale was very, very low. And um, 
the men insisted that he capture ships that were outside the rules of his commission. And he did, um, he could not control his men. And so when he went outside the rules of his commission, meaning went outside capturing other ships that were not French enemy ships, that's when he crossed the line to turn pirate. He became a pirate. All right, all right. Um, again, we're getting some more in. Um, was there any solidarity among the wives of other pirates? Now, this one is, I think, is pretty interesting. Um, there were. There, there were. There was a petition that 49 Madagascar pirate wives signed and sent to Queen Anne in 1707, asking that the queen allow their husbands to be, to keep their stolen loot and also to pardon their husbands because their husband's stolen loot was all they had to live on. Remember mariners wives, <laughs> especially well, pirates wives, they, they didn't get paychecks. <laughs> if they didn't capture any treasure, they didn't have anything to, to live on, to send home. So there was solidarity among these pirates' wives, and that's seen in this petition where these women um, all signed, signed in. And by the way, Queen Anne did not um, grant their petition, <laughs> unfortunately. That is very unfortunate. Um, did Captain Kidd have any siblings or any other family members that we know of? If he did, um, we don't know of them. He, he grew up, he was born and grew up in Dundee, Scotland, and he lost contact with his family. His father died when he was young and he took to the sea as a very young man. But he, there's no record whatsoever of him being in touch with his family members in Scotland. All right. Um, so it looks like we're at the end of the questions in the chat. Um, give the audience a round of applause for asking such great questions. Great questions. <laughs> um, does anybody, anybody else want to drop anything in the chat? All right. Well, Daphne, thank you so much for this presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. And um, I honestly can't wait to read your book. Well, thank I, you. I tried to get it from the library, um, but I think the library only had one copy and it was checked out. So. Oh, oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. So I am going to, I'll buy it from the museum when it comes in. And um, uh, thank you so much for, for giving this talk and, and, um, I think it was enjoyed by everybody. Oh, well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And it was a pleasure to, to answer all your questions. And it was very nice to meet you, Jessica. And nice to meet you, Maggie, too. It was nice to meet you as well. It was great to meet you. <laughs> oh, somebody just, somebody just entered the waiting room. <laughs> all right. Well, I guess that is our presentation for the evening. Um, our next event that's coming up is tomorrow night, um, if you want to join us for open mic night. And then we also have um, our, our next big event is a bluegrass concert at the end of April. So make sure you check our website for um, updated events and times. And thank you, everyone, for coming and have a good night. Thank you good so night. much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.